So I switch to English to welcome you to Collège de France. Thank you very much for coming here, making the trip. Uh, Mathieu uh, is a senior fellow. Uh, uh, what's the title exactly? I forgot already. Uh, senior research fellow. Senior research fellow uh, at Oxford and uh, sponsored by the Wellcome Trust. And uh, he's the author of a series of very important papers on uh, comparative primate cognition. Uh, he's by, I think it's fair to say that you are um, interested in general in decision making, uh, but decision making has many components, and uh, there is a social component of decision making, which you are particularly interested in. What are the circuits involved in taking decisions in a social context? And uh, I, I should say also, as part of that work, or maybe as a uh, partially separate line of research, you are especially interested in comparative approaches, trying to understand what's particular to the human brain compared to the monkey brain. And uh, so Mathieu Rochois is the author of a series of extremely interesting papers on brain imaging of a large number of uh, macaque monkeys systematically analyzing the local signals, comparing, deciding whether we can make analogies or not. So I'm pretty sure I will cover much of your work in my course next year. I will have to uh, do my homework and read uh, very closely a lot of this very important work. But today I'm extremely happy that you accepted uh, this invitation. Thank you. Thank you. OK. so. Uh, well, I, I am very grateful for the invitation to speak here today. I'm, I'm sorry that it's in English, uh, but it would be more incomprehensible if it was in my French. Uh, so what Stan asked me to talk about today was to talk about uh, the neural mechanisms, the brain mechanisms of social cognition, and to try and uh, provide some type of um, uh, evolutionary or cross-species context in which to understand those mechanisms in, in, in humans and in other primates uh, like monkeys. So I'm going to be talking about this part of the brain, the part that you've just been hearing about in Stan's lecture earlier on this morning. This is the, the cortex. So uh, we've got a, a human brain here and a macaque monkey brain here. These are drawings that were made by, um, by a German anatomist so, uh, about 100 years ago, Brodmann, who pointed out that the cortex uh, can be uh, decomposed into a mosaic of different areas. And as Stan's just been explaining to you, many of these different areas seem to have different functions. They seem to be involved in different aspects of, uh, of cognition, perception, uh, and action. Now, I'm going to be showing you some pictures that look a bit like this, but I'm also going to be showing you some pictures that look like this as well. This is a, a cross-section, uh, a cut taken through a brain uh, like that, a coronal cross-section taken through the brain. And you can see why the cortex has its name. It, it looks like the bark of a tree. So we're going to be looking at a number of images uh, uh, such as these. And the first thing that I wanted to get across is before I start talking about how the cortex in different species might be specialized for social cognition, I just wanted to emphasize that this is just one aspect of the way in which cortex is specialized for many different types of jobs in different types of mammals. So, uh, for example, uh, some of these areas uh, at the back here are specialized for, for visual cognition, for visual perception. Others are uh, specialized for auditory perception. Others for somatosensation, the sense of touch. And if we look in different mammals, we'll see that some of these areas become expanded depending on the different environments and the different ways in which animals have adapted to those environments. So, for example, uh, we know that about uh, 55 million years ago, many uh, primates uh, stopped being nocturnal, like many, animal, many early mammals were nocturnal, but primates stopped being nocturnal. They began to forage by daylight, and they developed uh, very sophisticated advanced vision. And to subserve that, their visual cortex became really quite large. So much of this part of the human brain is concerned with some aspect of vision. In the macaque monkey brain here that you can see, uh, all of these areas uh, have some role in vision. This picture here is a picture of the cortex that's been flattened out as if it were a sheet uh, and showing you that uh, uh, a great part of it is concerned with vision. Other mammals have taken different courses in evolutionary history. So uh, this is a star-nosed mole, an animal that has a very sophisticated sense of touch 
It finds its prey using its sense of touch because it lives, in, uh, it lives partly underground and in very uh, dark, uh, muddy, swampy areas. Uh, and so what it's elaborated is this part of the cortex here, the part concerned with the sense of touch, because it uses uh, this very sensitive nose that it has to find its prey uh, uh, under the ground and in swampy water. And you can see that somatosensory cortex very much enlarged, and particular parts of it enlarged as well, those parts that are related uh, to its nose that it uses for finding its way around. Here's another example of, a, of another type of mammal, again, with a very different type of specialization. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, we're looking at a, at a, at a bat, uh, and now it's part of the auditory cortex that's very specialized. So uh, here's the bat brain here. All of the colored areas are concerned with auditory processing. The very enlarged pink area is particularly concerned with those frequencies that the bat uses uh, when it's uh, using echolocation to find uh, the, the prey that it eats. So we know that one of the specializations that primates have then is in their sensory system, in their visual sensory system. But that's not the only thing that they, they have that's special. We know that about uh, 35 million years or so ago, there was a period of, of uh, dramatic climatic change that resulted in uh, a new way for these animals to start foraging. We know that they uh, often... Uh, many mon modern primates, we know that they often range over very large territories, often looking for fruit in many different types of trees. Uh, but at any one time, only a very small percentage, maybe uh, about 1 to 5% of those trees will have fruit in them. And so the animal has to remember this large range that it uh, negotiates. It has to um, be able to plan its way through that route. And as a consequence, the frontal lobes, a brain area concerned with planning, uh, and decision-making uh, became very developed in, in many old-world primates, such as uh, humans and monkeys, such as this one, the, the macaque. So that was another way in which, um, in, in which primates developed uh, in order to uh, be adapted uh, for their environment. <clears throat> but what I'm going to focus on is a third aspect of the environment of primates that's been very influential in their, in their evolution. One of the most important things about the environment of many primate species, including humans, isn't anything about the physical environment. The critical thing that really causes problems for many primates, and often for us as well, are the existence of many other primates all around us all the time. And indeed, uh, when you leave the lecture theater and you're, you're talking with your friends, most of the time, what you'll be talking about will be about other humans, the things that they've done that you like or dislike, the problems that they've caused you. And so it's the social environment that particularly impinges on many primate species. And just as we've seen that whether or not an animal lives in the light or the dark affects the way in which its sensory uh, systems have been developed, we should, think, we should expect to see some impact of the social environment uh, on the development of, of, uh, of primate brains as well. One argument that's been made by Robin Dunbar is called the social brain hypothesis. And according to this argument, actually, it's the complexity of the social groups that primates live in that has been the primary engine for the development of the large size of the primate brain. So this is just uh, one uh, a piece of evidence that Robin Dunbar and his colleagues have put forward uh, in support of, of, of this case. And basically what it's plotting uh, here is what they call an encephalization index. This is uh, an index that is, um, that is in brief, it's, it's estimating the change in the size of the brain with increasing body size. And it's plotting that against the size of the social, or, or against the, the um, the prominence of social groups in these different animal species, in these different animal orders. And what we can see at the uh, top on the right-hand side here are primates, animals that have the, uh, a particularly high ratio on this measure. So their brains have become particularly enlarged given their body size, and there's a particular uh, uh, predominance of social group living in this order of animals. So what I'm going to tell you about are a couple of experiments from, from our lab 
that were trying to define circuits for social cognition. And the first experiment that I'm going to tell you about is one where we were trying to look in macaque monkeys as well. Now, so far, I've been telling you about how over the course of evolutionary time, there might be an impact on neural circuits, the, the way in which they're, they're organized and their, and their prominence in the brain. But also, uh, there's maybe a possibility that even during the lifetime of an individual, that, uh, that, that there will be changes in neural circuits as a result of the environments in which they live. So what we wanted to do in this experiment was to test this possibility by looking at the brains of macaque monkeys using a non-invasive MRI scanner and examining the sizes of those macaque monkey brains as a function of the different social groups that they lived in in the laboratory. So some of the animals, there was one animal that lived by itself, there were quite a few that lived in a group of two, some in groups of three, some in groups of four, and, and so on. And what we wanted to see was whether or not the size of the social network that each animal experienced had any impact on its brain structure and function. Now that might seem like a slightly crazy thing to do, but we've known for a little while now that the brain is very plastic. For example, uh, in a study conducted a few years before, um, uh, young students in Oxford University were trained to juggle. And as a consequence of just a month's experience juggling, there were changes in the cortex uh, in these areas that are highlighted in red here, as their manual skill, their visual motor coordination in the juggling task improved. So we thought that these animals are spending many hours per day in these different social groups, and we checked to see if the social groups had been stable over time, and, and they often were. Uh, and so we thought perhaps there would be a similar impact of the social environment, the social practice that these animals have, with more individuals in some groups than in others. We also have to <clears throat> check that none of these changes that we find are just related to the age or the weight of the animals. Uh, so uh, we can do that using a, 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 an analytical procedure called um, multiple regression. Now the way in which we carry out the experiment is to take scans of all of our different macaque monkey brains. So this is another uh, cross-section taken through an MRI scan. This time we're looking at a cross-section that's going like that through the, through the brain. Uh, this is one individual, here's another, Here's another. And what we can do is we can take all of our different individual scans of animals, um, and in these experiments we've taken uh, sometimes 20, sometimes 30 different scans, and we can try and walk them together onto a common template. So in order to do that, there might be one monkey, say, that's a bit smaller than others, that has a smaller brain, and we have to maybe stretch it a little bit. So we're not stretching the real brain, we're, st we're stretching the electronic representation of the MRI scan to fit this common template. In other cases, we're compacting and compressing the scan so that it fits onto this average template. Now, once we've, <clears throat> once we've got this average template, what we can do is we can go back and look at our different brains and look at exactly how we've stretched them or, or compacted them. And the images that we have on the MRI scans are a little bit like camera images that are composed up of uh, different individual small pixels. These MRI scans are composed of 3D pixels called voxels. And what we can see is that sometimes there might be um, one of these uh, areas composed of voxels that uh, in one individual we have to compact in order to meet the average size of the group. And in another individual, we might have to expand it. So what we did was to look at the degree to which we had expanded or contracted different areas throughout the entire brain in these different animals um, as a function of the social group size in which they lived. And we also checked to see whether or not age and weight and many other factors have some influence on their brain as well. But I'm just going to focus today on, on the social network effects. And what we see is that there's an area in this part of the brain here, it's called the superior temporal sulcus, or the STS for short, where the amount of grey matter, the size of the cortex, seems to be proportional to the social network size that the animals live in. So if animals live in a larger social group, this area gets very slightly bigger, not by much, by just a millimetre or two, but it's a measurable amount. It's not the only place. There's another area 
in an anterior part of the prefrontal cortex that seems to do something similar. So this is just plotting the results here. Here we've got our index of stretching or compacting of the, of the brain. Uh, and then here we've got the social group size that the animals are living in. So these two parts of the graph relate to these parts of the brain here, and this graph relates to this part of the brain here. So, so far then, what I've shown you is that the structure of the brain is changing at, to a small but measurable degree as a function of the social group size that animals experience. Now, we can also take other types of measurements with our, our brain scanner. As in addition to looking at the structure of the brain, we can also get some measure of its activity. We know that neurons in the brain are primarily working uh, as a result of their, uh, the, the way in which we, that they're operating is in terms of generating electrical activity. Um, and we can't measure that <clears throat> directly with the MRI scanner, but we can measure some of the um, blood oxygenation changes that occur as a result of that electrical activity occurring in different parts of the brain. So as different parts of the brain become active, the way in which the blood is oxygenated in the vicinity changes, and depending on the ratio of oxygenated um, uh, uh, um, oxygenated haemoglobin and deoxygenated haemoglobin, we're able to identify those working regions of the brain. So what we've looked at is just how the activity measured in these brain areas is coupled, whether it's strongly coupled together or weakly coupled together. And one thing that we've noticed is that these two regions where there are structural changes are also regions where the activity becomes more and more closely coupled as the animals live in larger and larger social groups, as if the areas are more and more used to working closely together. This isn't the only region where they uh, become more closely coupled together. There's also another important region, a third region, the anterior cingulate gyrus, that also becomes coupled together with these brain areas. So what we've got then, uh, uh, for now, a set of three brain regions that we're going to focus on. The STS, the superior temporal sulcus, anterior prefrontal cortex, and anterior cingulate gyrus, where uh, there's evidence either in terms of brain structure or brain function uh, for changes that are related to the size of the social network that these animals experience. So, so far then, what I've, um, we've got some evidence that the social environment that the animals live in has some impact on the brain. But brain-environment relationships are not just one-directional things. They're, they're, uh, it's a two-way street. What we also want to look at is how do these brain areas relate to uh, social behavior? Are they really causally important for social behavior? So. Uh, what we can do is we can carry out a couple of other additional tests. If these brain areas that seem to be the ones that are most affected by the complexity of the social environment are important for social cognition, then perhaps we might expect them to be a bit bigger in those animals that are good at social cognition. And one measure of how good an animal is at social cognition is how dominant it is within the group of other individuals that it lives with. Now, monkeys become dominant not just as a function of how big or how aggressive they are, they become dominant as a function of their ability to form social relationships with other animals. What they do is they form coalitions with other individuals in order to become dominant. And that's a critical determin determinant of their success. So the first thing that we can do is look to see at whether or not uh, these uh, brain regions uh, are, are, are different in individuals who are dominant. Another thing that we can do is we can look at what happens if we disrupt the activity in these circuits by making a very focal lesion in one part of this brain circuit. So we're going to look at this first idea first of all, and this is a result of another type of analysis where we're looking to see whether or not the variation in these areas, there's this STS area I was telling you about before, there's the anterior prefrontal area that I was telling you about before. We've seen that part of the variation in the size of this area is related to the social group size that the animals live in. And that's what's plotted again uh, here in, um, in green uh, for the STS area in the left and right hemisphere and for the prefrontal cortex here. But in red, 
these other parts of the figure are showing that part of the variation is related to how dominant these animals are in their social group. So animals that are socially successful are ones in which this area is very slightly, uh, it's very slightly but measurably larger. Now it turns out they're not the only areas. There are in fact uh, other areas of the brain where the effects are even stronger. Uh, these are areas uh, shown here, including the amygdala, uh, parts of the uh, posterior hypothalamus uh, and, and the raphe nucleus, where the grey matter is particularly closely related to how dominant the animal is. But at least we've got some evidence on that last slide showing that some of these areas that are responsive to the social environment are also related to how well the animal is performing in a, in a real life day-to-day -day test of social cognition, how successful it is within the group. Now the other thing that we can do is we can look at what happens when we uh, disrupt uh, these brain areas. And I'm going to focus now on the third one of this triplet of areas that we're going to be looking at, the anterior cingulate gyrus. What we've tried doing is looking at the impact of making a small lesion in this brain area while animals are responding to other animals. And we have a very, very simple test. So we have our, our, our monkey that we're looking at in a small cage here. And in front of it, it can see a perspex box with a small item of food. Now, a normal monkey in such a situation, as soon as a screen here is raised up so it can see the food item, will reach up and pick up that food item. But it turns out that animals will be a bit slower if on a, on a computer monitor here, there's an image of another monkey being played to them. Or if there is uh, something interesting in this perspex box underneath the food item. So what we're going to do then is we're going to take a measure of the animal's reaching speed, the latency to pick up the food item in various different social contexts as a function of what the monkey can see on the screen uh, on the other side of the food. So what I'm, I'll show you first of all is how this test works. And first of all, what we'll be looking at is a video of a monkey that's shot from, uh, from uh, a, a camera that's placed here that's looking towards the monkey we're testing. And here you can see a small peanut that the animal can pick up here. We're going to measure how quickly the animal picks up that peanut. Uh, and in this case, the test item that's being examined uh, to see whether or not the animal is interested in it is a, is, is a tube of, um, of British deodorant, a tube of, of lynx deodorant. And as we'll see, the animal isn't interested in this item at all, uh, and it goes straight away to pick up the food item. So as soon as it can see it, it reaches out to pick up that, that uh, food item, uh, and there's nothing really else in the environment uh, that detains it or, or seems to be uh, of, of any interest to the animal. But now, this time, we're going to look at another video, and this time, we've got the same peanut that's available to the animal, but this time, the monkey can see on the screen here an image of another animal, and it's a large dominant male that it can see. And so you can see that as much as monkeys like peanuts, they're even more interested in the presence of other animals. Uh, and I think the video is still running, but the animal is looking very carefully to see what this other monkey that it can see might do. So <clears throat> here, what we're doing is we're plotting the latencies, the, the time it takes for the animal to reach out to pick up the food item, depending on the presence on the video of other different animals. So uh, in this situation here, where our monkey is confronted by an image of a staring monkey, it takes a long time to reach out and pick up the food item. There are other uh, pictures of other animals here, and they also affect how quickly the animal will reach out to pick up the food item. This is the case with normal control animals, but if we make that small lesion in that anterior cingulate gyrus region, then uh, the animals shown in white here, their behavior isn't really modulated in the same way by the presence of another individual. So the, the impact of the other animals isn't as great anymore. 
Okay, so, so far then, uh, I've been telling you a little bit about uh, very basic aspects of social behavior in, in macaque monkeys. But how much does this have any relevance to understanding human social behavior? Many people think that there's a basic difference in the way in which humans engage in social interaction compared with all other animals. And the idea is that they have a special ability that's sometimes referred to as theory of mind. And what theory of mind means is that we as humans are able not just to have thoughts, but to think about thoughts. We're able not just to have representations in our brains of the things around us, but we're able to represent the representations that somebody else might have as well. So this is called theory of mind. The idea is that you have a theory of the mind of the person sitting next to you. If they uh, inadvertently uh, kick against your leg while they're sitting next to you, well, you have uh, some idea of what might have led them to do that, whether it was done intentionally or whether it was an accident. And the idea is, the suggestion is, is that many other animals don't have that type of representation. So here's a classic test of this notion of theory of mind, and it relies on testing whether or not a person can think about something that isn't actually true. It's designed as a test for very young children. So uh, what happens in this test is that the young children uh, are shown these uh, simple cartoon pictures. Uh, so they're, they're told that uh, this is Sally and this is Anne. Then they're told that Sally has a ball and she hides it in her basket. Then she goes for a walk. And while she goes for a walk, Anne takes out the ball from the basket and she puts the ball in the box. So when Sally comes back, the question is, if she wants to play with the ball, where will she look? And the idea is that it's very obvious to most people that the place where she should look is in the basket where she put it, even though we know that that's not true, that isn't where the ball is. But if we can represent the thoughts of another person, if we can represent the thoughts of this cartoon figure in this case, then we should anticipate that this is where they're going to look. And the idea is that that ability to think about something that isn't true is a very unusual ability. And it might be uh, something that's limited to only a few species of animals, perhaps only to humans, according to some people. Well, I'm going to show you, first of all, some experiments that try and look at this notion in, uh, in, in the human brain. Um, and again, uh, we're going to be looking at experiments that are conducted in an MRI scanner, but now we're going to be looking at experiments that are conducted with human subjects. So our subjects in this task spend about an hour in a scanner performing a very simple task while they try and work out which of two cards they should pick in order to win points. And they do this because the points that they win are going to be translated into money at the end of the experiment. And they, can, they have many opportunities to choose between these cards, and they can learn from their experience over the course of several different trials in the experiment. So they get given a chance time and time again uh, to make the choice. So they see the two cards, they make a choice. In this case, the subject might have uh, uh, picked uh, the green card, and this feedback on the screen that they can see is telling them, uh, yes, you've picked the green card. But in addition, in this experiment, as well as learning from experience of, uh, from, from their own behavior, they're also given advice by somebody else that they're told is also playing the card game at the same time and who knows the correct answers. So they have a confederate, somebody working with them. Now, the subject's goal is to reach uh, is, is to accumulate a score that gradually increases during the course of the experiment. If they get to a certain level, they win a large sum of money. If they get to another level, they win another, an even larger sum of money. But the confederate has different goals. The confederate will win most money if they can get the subject to reach this level of performance, and they'll get a smaller amount if they reach this level of performance. So although they are working together with someone who knows the answers, who's going to give them advice, the other person who's giving them advice doesn't have the same motives for giving the advice. They might not always give advice truthfully. So sometimes they're going to be lying. And 
Of course, lying, in a way, is a little bit like that test that we just saw with the Sally Ann task. In order to lie, in order to detect a lie, you have to work out that somebody is thinking about something that isn't, in fact, factually the case. So what we're going to look at, then, is how brain activity changes as a function of whether or not the subject in the MRI scanner thinks the other person is lying to them. And we're also going to look at how it changes every time they update their sense of whether or not the other person is lying to them. We have a very simple uh, mathematical model for looking at how people update their sense of whether or not someone else is, is lying to them that we don't need to go into now, but I'm happy to answer questions about later on. But basically, one part of the model is saying, how much do you update and change your sense of, about the other person's honesty when you find out whether or not uh, they were or were not lying to you on any trial in the experiment. And when that related to that parameter, there are activity changes in uh, two regions of the brain. The anterior prefrontal cortex here, uh, and then uh, a brain region that's called the temporal parietal junction, or the TPJ here. Another parameter in the model here is related to how big an impact each piece of information about the other person has uh, on, on your decision making. And that's related to activity changes in the anterior cingulate gyrus. So perhaps losing this bit of tissue here, as we saw in some of those animals earlier on, explains why the other, seeing other animals doesn't have the same impact on their behavior anymore. So what we've seen then is a circuit of brain regions in our human subjects that's concerned with representing the, um, uh, the, the intentions of another individual and is related to the impact of those intentions on our behavior. So do they have any relationship to these brain areas over here? If there is something special about this theory of mind ability, the ability to think about thoughts in humans, then we would expect that there would be no link between these areas in the humans and these areas in other primates, such as macaques. And what I'm going to argue is that there is some type of link, and we can see that perhaps most clearly if we forget about the behavior for a few minutes, if we forget about whether or not we can design an ideal test for proving this theory of mind process in other animals apart from humans, and if instead, if we focus on the anatomy of the brain. One of the things that we can exploit is the fact that this mosaic of areas in the brain, in humans or, and in other animals, has each part of the mosaic has different types of connections. So it has different types of inputs and different types of outputs. And these special connections that it has with the rest of the brain determine the type of information it receives, and they determine the type of influence that each brain area can have on other parts of the brain. And one of the things that Dick Passingham, a, a scientist in Oxford, pointed out a few years ago is that although any given brain region, say this one here, might share some connections that are similar to the connections of another one, say this one here, the total fingerprint, the total distributed set of connections of any area is unique. And it constitutes what he called a fingerprint. So this is an example of some fingerprints here for an area in the frontal lobe. What it's showing us on, this, uh, on the circumference of this circle is whether or not a certain particular area, called area 14, but it doesn't matter what the area is, it's showing how well connected it is with other areas in the frontal lobe. So we've got the various different other areas in the frontal lobe, area 8, area 9, area 10, area 11, and so on. Just forget about their identities for a second, but concentrate on the fact that this red line is high at the top here, and this is telling us that our area that we're interested in, area 14, is strongly connected to all of these areas that are shown on this part of the circumference, but it's not strongly connected with any of these areas on this part of the circumference. So it's got a special type of connection or fingerprint that another area in the brain, this time area 9, doesn't seem to have. This is the fingerprint of, out, of inputs to the areas, and this is the fingerprint of outputs from the areas. So what we can do is we can exploit the fact that these areas have these unique connectional fingerprints and see whether or not we can match up the connectional fingerprints of areas in the human brain 
with areas in the macaque monkey brain. And we can use our non-invasive MRI scanner for doing this. And the way that we, we do it is to take those activity measures that I was telling you about earlier on, of, of uh, our measures of brain activity, from different regions in the macaque monkey brain, for example. So we might take them from a very small area, say the area that's highlighted in red there. And then what we do is we examine how that activity is correlated with activity in the rest of the brain. So as activity goes up, even while an animal is just resting or asleep or even anaesthetized, the activity in that brain area will fluctuate and go up and down. And as it goes up and down, it will go that the activity in other brain areas will go up and down as well. And it turns out that the areas that are interconnected with this area here will uh, go up and down in tandem together. So all of these orange areas here, the activity is going up and down in tandem with this brain region here. All of the areas in blue, it's actually uh, negatively correlated. So this map here gives us a sense of the connections of this brain region here. And we can draw our fingerprint of connections for this monkey brain region. And then what we can do is we can uh, look through the human brain and look to see whether or not there is an area that has the same pattern of connections with the rest of the human brain. In other words, we can search for brain areas that have similar types of connectional fingerprints in the two species and see if we can map, match up areas with the same types of connections to the rest of the brain. And if we do that for this area that we saw was involved in detecting another person in a lie in, in the human brain, here's its connectional fingerprint uh, that's shown in red here. And for the monkey, we can see the best fitting match in blue. And that area is highlighted here in, in red. So even though it might be debatable about whether or not monkeys can engage in exactly the same types of thought processes, they seem to have brain areas that are wired up with other parts of the monkey brain in a similar way to the way in which this part of the human brain is wired up to the rest of the human brain. In other words, there seem to be circuits with some degree of similarity in the two species. Here's, one of the, here's the second area that seemed to be active when our human subjects were detecting other people in a lie, the TPJ area. This area of the brain has uh, strong connections uh, to the various other brain regions that are shown on this graph here. Um, and so what we can do is we can search throughout the monkey brain for an area that also has this same set of connections to the corresponding regions in the rest of the monkey brain. So <clears throat> what we here are all the uh, areas that we know uh, are connected up uh, to this TPJ region in, in, in the human. These areas are strongly connected. These areas are negatively, weakly connected. Um, and so what we can do is we can find their homologues in the macaque monkey, <clears throat> and we can look for a brain region that is interacting with these regions in the monkey, just like these regions are acting with, interacting with the TPJ and the human subjects. And if we do that, we find that the, the region that looks like the TPJ in our humans is here in that superior temporal sulcus in the monkeys. This is the region that I told you about before that is expanding and getting bigger as the group size that a monkey experience, experiences gets larger. So again, we've got some evidence for some similarities in the neural circuits that are present in humans and these other species. So, Although the one thing that's probably important to emphasize is that although there are similarities, they are never complete. And although we can find the best match for this human brain area in a macaque monkey, and it turns out to be this STS region, the match still isn't very good compared with some other areas. So some areas seem to match up very closely together in the different species. But nevertheless, we can find an approximate, approximate match even for this brain area concerned with very sophisticated aspects of human social cognition with an area in another primate species. There are also other differences in the ways in which brain areas interconnect in the different species. This is a slide summarizing the way in which auditory areas of the brain interconnect with parts of the frontal lobes in humans and in monkeys. So we're looking at how the auditory areas connect up with all of these areas in humans and in monkeys that are colored in here. 
And these are the data in, hum in humans shown in blue and in monkeys shown in green. And to cut a long story short, essentially what it shows is that auditory areas of the brain are connected to these parts of the prefrontal cortex in humans, and these are all concerned with rule-guided behavior, perhaps because of the complex rule-guided way in which auditory information is used to construct language in humans. But there isn't the same evidence for the same strong connection pattern to the same degree in the macaque monkeys. Instead, the auditory information in the macaque monkeys is, seems to be more strongly channeled towards some of these cingulate regions, which are concerned with social behavior uh, rather than uh, to the rule-guided language-related areas uh, in the manner that they are in, in humans. OK, <clears throat> so I've, I've nearly finished. And the, what I've tried to tell you about so far are the fact that there are these um, uh, brain regions that seem to constitute a circuit for social cognition. I've told you about how there seem to be um, uh, some similarities between animals uh, such as macaques and humans. I've tried to show you that the social environment has an impact on these brain regions, as well as these brain regions underlying and being causally important for social behavior. So what I want to go back to in the very last experiment that I'm going to tell you about is, is it the case as well that in humans that the social environment that we live in has some impact on our brains and on the way in which we think about ourselves? So just as we saw earlier on uh, that the, the size of the social environment impacts on the structure and the activity of a macaque monkey's brain, is something similar happening to us. And what I want to look at is how we estimate our own abilities. One of the things that we're often very interested in about ourselves in comparison to other people is how well are we doing? Are we doing well or are we doing, doing badly? And what I want to look at that is how we make those estimations in a social context. So <clears throat> in this last experiment, we have human subjects uh, in an MRI scanner again, and our human subjects are being asked to do some very simple tasks. And in some ways, the tasks don't really matter. They're just going to be a vehicle for us to look at how we assess how well we're doing something. In this particular case, uh, the subject is being shown a small circle on a screen for a few, uh, uh, for, for a, a small fraction of a second. And then uh, another second or so later, they see another circle. And as soon as it's been on the screen for the same amount of time as the first one, they have to press a button uh, to indicate that was the time period. It's a very difficult task to do, but we give them some feedback telling them how well they're, they're doing in the task every so often. We also have another similar task, and again, the details don't really matter, but what we can do is we can manipulate the feedback that we give to our subjects to change and alter their sense of how well they're doing on this task. Now, while they're doing this task, they're told that there's somebody else who's also doing the task at the same time. And what they're asked to do in the experiment while they're in the MRI scanner is on different points in the experiment, they're told that uh, <clears throat> depending on whether or not they think they're performing the task well, they can either have a competition with the other player and see who does best on any given task, or they can collaborate with the other player so that they can pool the points that they're winning from performing this task in order to both earn more money. And one of the things that uh, we find in the experiment is that the way in which people assess their performance isn't always entirely related to how well they're doing, but instead it's related to how well other people are doing. And the, the short uh, take-home message of this is going to be that if you spend your time collaborating and cooperating with other people who are very talented, you're going to suffer from the delusion that you're better at these tasks than you are really. So, for example, if by uh, some magical process uh, you woke up tomorrow and you were playing in the French national football team, you would come to think fairly soon that you were actually rather good at football as a consequence of, of associating with all of these other people. And we can see this 
in the, in the behavioural results that I'm going to show you now. So what we do is we ask our subjects every so often in the experiment to rate how good they are at the tasks. So uh, this is their uh, rating of how good they are themselves, self-ability. We also ask them to rate how good the other person is. This is uh, their other ability or O ability rating. And it turns out that, not surprisingly and quite rationally, the rating of self-ability is related and determined by your recent performance. The recent performance of the self determines the rating of the ability of the self. And the recent performance of the other determines the rating that we give to the other person's performance. But there's also a small crossover effect as well. So that means that if you're collaborating with somebody who's very good at performing these games, do you begin to think that you're a bit better than you really are? And the crossover goes in both directions. So if you're doing very well at one of these games, you begin to start thinking that the other person is a bit better than they really are. You can see this in the results here. So here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, uh, uh, we're looking at the influence of your performance on the last trial, two trials ago, three trials ago, four trials ago, on your estimate of how good you are at performing the task. And you can see that you are influenced by your real uh, genuine performance on the task, and you're influenced a lot by what's happened most recently and to a small extent by the more remote part, past. And similarly, when you try and estimate how good the other person is, you're influenced by their recent performance and to a smaller degree by their performance in the more remote past. But in addition, we also see, when you're trying to judge your own ability, you can, we also see that there's a small positive effect of collaborating with a good other performer and a small but nevertheless significant negative impact of collaborating with a good performer when you're competing with them. So if you collaborate with somebody good, you're deluded into thinking you're better than you really are. If you're competing with them, then you're deluded into thinking that you're worse than you really are. And the effect is also present uh, when we judge other people. If we're good, we think uh, and we're collaborating with them, we think they're a bit better than they really are. If we're competing with them, we end up thinking that they're a bit worse than they really are. So <clears throat> how are these effects mediated in the brain? Well, this measure here of the rational impact of our performance on our estimates of our ability seems to be related to activity in a perigenual part of the of, of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. This is a brain area I haven't really been telling you much about, but it maybe fits with some ideas about this area tracking how uh, successful our choices are, or perhaps in this case, tracking how successful we are at performing this game. So activity here co-varies with how well we've done recently. And the activity varies a little bit from one person to the next. But in those subjects where uh, there is lots of this activity, people tend to be using their past performance a lot to make judgments about their own ability. By contrast, this effect here, which reflects the irrational influence of other people on our estimates of our own ability, is associated with activity in this part of the prefrontal cortex that I was telling you about before. This is the area that we're using to track whether or not somebody else uh, is... Uh, for example, lying to us. This is the part of the brain that seems to be tracking how well other people are, are, are performing at this game. But while it does that, one unfortunate side effect, one unfortunate consequence of that is that it changes the way in which we think about ourselves. Because people who show this activity to a greater degree are the same people who, in this situation here, are most influenced in a negative way by the performance of another person when estimating their own ability. So these people who show this strong effect in this brain region here are strongly adversely affected in their estimates of themselves by uh, being in the presence of somebody else who's good at performing this game. So it seems as if the way in which we think about ourselves, even from one moment to the next in this game, is changing as a function not just of what we're doing ourselves, but as a function of what's happening around us and how well other people are performing. So it seems then that these brain areas in humans are maybe responsible for generating some of the social behaviour that we produce, but they're also the recipients or the conduits for the influence of that social environment 
back onto ourselves as well. Okay, so um, thanks very much for your attention. Uh, these are the collaborators in, in Oxford uh, that the experiments were conducted with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I think we have uh, time for a discussion of this great talk. There's a lot that was covered, and maybe some of you would like to ask some precisions. Uh, maybe I'll start with one. So, um, would you like to comment on the lateralization of this system in the brain? I think even in the monkey, you were showing a very right lateralized system. And it's a bit unusual to find lateralization in the cortex of the monkey. Um, so, how systematic is that? And is there any control lateralization in humans to the language system? Do we know that? Uh, so, okay, that's a, that's a very good question. So, um, the, the results that I was showing you use a very stringent type of statistical test. And so um, what we often report are the brain regions that very clearly and categorically pass the most stringent statistical tests. But often we see something very similar that maybe isn't quite so statistically significant in the other hemisphere. <coughs> so in the case of the monkeys particularly, I'd be very hesitant to emphasize uh, any, um, any hem hemispheric specialization. But in humans, uh, that really is, is true. So you know, that arguably is one other very unusual feature of the cortex in, in, the, in humans, is that difference between the two different hemispheres. There is, some, uh, there is a small amount of evidence for, uh, as, as you know, for some asymmetry in auditory processing in the, in, in the monkey, but it's been very controversial. Um, and so I'd be very hesitant about suggesting that there's a, a strong lateralization in, in the monkeys. But in humans, there is some evidence for some right hemisphere lateralization uh, in some cases. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? Oui, uh, allez-y. Uh, 